Good evening, everyone. Welcome to World Turtle Day at the Explorers Club. We're very excited to have you here to celebrate with us tonight. My name is Callie Vielenturf, and I will be your host for the evening. I'm a marine conservation biologist, National Geographic Explorer, and 2020 Early Career Leader, a young professional with the United Nations Harmony with Nature Program, and a UN Youth Representative and Fellow of the Explorers Club. I'm also the founder and executive director of the Leatherback Project, which I will share more about later on. May 23rd, World Turtle Day is a day to commemorate the existence of an impressive biodiversity of terrestrial, freshwater, and marine turtle species, and an opportunity to draw attention to threats facing their survival. Although many species have come and gone since their first appearance in the fossil record 300 million years ago, there are approximately 356 turtle species on planet Earth today. Unfortunately, about 40% of these species are threatened or endangered with extinction. There are, however, actions that we can take to help reverse these declining trends and many people around the world who are dedicating their lives to protecting our incredible shelled biodiversity. Tonight, we have an outstanding lineup of speakers who will share information about the turtle species that they study and the lifelong journeys that they're on to protect them. These conservationists are genuine and dedicated spirits and a testament to what changes for nature can result when you combine a passion for wildlife and a determination to make a difference. Throughout the program, please be thinking about your questions that you have for the speakers. You can send them in via Facebook Live or YouTube, and don't forget to specify who your question's for. To start, we will hear from Dr. Brian D. Horn. Brian is a lifelong turtle biologist who has conducted field research on six continents and has lived abroad in Mexico and India. Dr. Horn currently serves as the Wildlife Conservation Society's coordinator for freshwater turtle and tortoise conservation and oversees their recovery projects for the world's most endangered turtles across the globe. Brian will orient us to the turtles of the world, whether they be tortoises, freshwater turtles, or sea turtles, and share some of his experiences. Brian, I turn it over to you. Hi there, everyone. Um, uh, Kylie, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I work uh, with Wildlife Conservation Society out of uh, New York, out of the Bronx Zoo. And my, my role is to help uh, facilitate projects by WCS across the globe. Uh, they're in 52 countries with offices and we are expanding our turtle program as the turtles are considered a, a priority conservation group uh, within the species program. So um, we rank turtles as being extremely important and we are trying to ensure that no species goes extinct and that we can recover turtles uh, of the very small populations, recover those populations to their full ecological Roll. So with that, I'm going to uh, share my screen. And there's my name. So, so as Callie, uh, she stole my thunder, yes, about 40 to 50% of the turtles are um, threatened with extinction. Um, and that's, that's on par, you know, with primates, you know, your, your, your monkeys, your great apes, your lemurs. Um, it's higher than amphibians, even though there are many more amphibians. It, by percentage-wise, it's higher than amphibians. And it's, it's also higher than birds. And that's due to a certain number of key factors. Why this small group of about 300 50 species, more or less, with some new species coming, you know, there's always new species being described. Um, but not anywhere near as frogs. And we're gonna look at this vast array of differences uh, from the very smallest to the, to the very uh, largest. And I think we can see that um, turtles are quite unique uh, amongst all uh, vertebrates. And um, these unique factors is part of the reasons why they um, suffer so greatly at the hands of humans. So global turtle diversity. This is um, a paper that was done by my uh, good friend, Kurt Buhlman, and they looked at some river drainages and they tried to figure out where the greatest diversity of turtles was. And if you look right about there in the mobile drainage, there's a lot of turtles. But then if you look way over here 
in the, the Brahmaputra Ganges River Basin, there's a much greater diversity of turtles. But in general, you have the southeastern United States, the Andes, Orinoco, uh, Amazon region, and then you have South and Southeast Asia. Those are where the, the greatest turtle diversity occurs. But interestingly, if you look at where human population is, you can see that it's very high in South and Southeast Asia. And that correlates with where the greatest number of turtles are. And this was a paper that I wrote, um, co-authored a number of years ago, and we continue to update it, um, of where some of the most endangered turtles were. And if you look at it, there's a big concentration in South and Southeast Asia. And that's a part due to the human density, the demands on habitat, the demands of on turtles for food, the demands of turtles for um, traditional medicine, and, you know, and true just habitat loss. We have some in Madagascar on the west coast. There's the um, plowshare tortoise found in a very small little habitat. Uh, long term estimates, there were a couple hundred individuals now. Uh, and now it's possibly we're, we're only all the the adults have been have been poached and we're only dealing with um, some juveniles left in the wild, but there are some insurance colonies. And then we also have um, some of the tortoises in South Africa. Uh, South Africa has the highest tortoise diversity um, of any place on the world, um, but there are also some very endangered ones there. Uh, if you go over to Latin America, you have um, this this dot here in southern Brazil, that's a turtle that's only found in the in the Rio Carangola River. Very small distribution. It's really evolutionary unique. It might actually um, be its own family of turtles. And you move into places like uh, Colombia, uh, and then then into um, Central America, as well as into the Galapagos. So you can see that it's it's spread out quite a lot. So why the decline? And, you know, there's, there's three big ones that are really pushing it. It's human consumption, people eating turtles. It's the traditional medicine use. Uh, some cultures have strong ties to uh, turtle flesh, uh, turtle eggs, turtle bones, turtle cartilage, believing that they have some medicinal value. And it's also the pet trade. And I want to, I want to, talk a little bit about that um, before I move on, because people have asked me in other times when I've given this talk about, oh, it's a pet trade. You know, I see, go to the pet store, I see one or two turtles and, you know, you know, you know I buy one for my kid and he has it. How, how can that be hurting global populations? Well, it's also just the massive scale of it, that it's global and that to realize for that one turtle to make it to the pet store, probably 10 or 20 died along the way. And that's the, was the historical model. But now what we're seeing is that turtles have become a commodity where um, prices of specific species, because they become more endangered, the prices on them increase by collectors. And as the prices increase, more are removed from the wild and it makes them even more rare. So it makes them more valuable. So we have seen a great number of, of people removing turtles. Um, and smuggling turtles. And it's also because the penalties for smuggling turtles is so low. Um, it's not near as, 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 as what severe as like smuggling drugs or weapons, but it's almost on par with the same amount of billions of dollars in wildlife smuggling. And this is the area with turtle conservation that we really need to improve a great deal because um, the 20, this century, we're seeing astronomical numbers of turtles being smuggled. And these are turtles that are critically endangered. Um, and because they're demanding prices in the, the tens, the twenties, the hundreds of thousands of dollars for the rare species, um, that it's become quite lucrative for organized crime to be uh, engaged in this. So don't, when I say pet tray, don't think of it as that you know, that, that turtle you see in the pet store for $5. You, you have to think of it as in the totality of it all where there is um, there is that small, you know, number of pet store turtles, but there's also this huge collector's market and the collector markets are sophisticated um, organized crime units. And then this is followed by, of course, habitat loss, loss of lowland wetlands, lowland rainforest, uh, loss of the desert, uh, 
draining of, of, of swamps and rivers, uh, damming of rivers, hydroelectric dams, um, and, so, and so forth. Greater urbanization, you know, loss of forest habitat, changes into agricultural habitat. But we also have to think about disease. And um, one disease that has been well studied um, is the upper respiratory disease in, in tortoises here in, in the US. And it was likely brought in from a pet tortoise brought from Africa. Um, it was a mycoplasma and that's a, that's a, it's, it's gets up into the nose and it causes irritation and that causes, you know, these respiratory problems and the turtles can't breathe very well through their nose. And, and because turtles rely so heavily, these tortoises rely so heavily on smell to eat their food when they can't smell, they don't eat and they eventually can starve to death. That's an oversimplification, but that's the general theme. And we've seen it had devastating impacts on the American uh, desert tortoise uh, and the American um, gopher tortoise. Um, so disease is very important. And the, the movement of wild turtles uh, needs to be a, of concern because if we do not want to introduce new novel diseases into, um, uh, into the wild. But also, you know, okay, human consumption. All right, I, I get it. I understand. But there's been, there was a really great study by Justin Cognon, and he was studying Blanding's turtles. I should have put a picture of a Blanding turtle up. And he showed that an annual increase of just 4% in adult mortality was significant enough to cause that population to go extinct. And that's really telling because what is it about turtles that, that can, can, cannot survive such a, a small amount of adult mortality? Well, it's their, it's their life history. So in general, turtles have very high adult survivorship. And you've all seen those really ancient turtles that seem to be Methuselah that are, are quite ancient. Well, when turtles reach a, a large size, they become more or less predator proof and um, they can live for a very long time and produce eggs for a very long time. But that's countered with that it often is slow to reach sexual maturity. Not, not at all species, and you know, a lot of tropical species can reach sexual maturity in you know, five years or less, but many temperate species often take 10, 20 years or more. Now, you know, larger turtles often take that long. There's very low nest survival, and there, you have slightly higher juvenile survival. So your nester can be destroyed by all kinds of predators, uh, beach erosion, sand erosion, hurricanes can come in, wipe them out, a big flood can come through. Um, and then the juveniles, you know, they're tasty little snacks for many predators. And this is an important part of turtles within the greater uh, food web. Turtles create an incredible amount of biomass that's food for many other species. So when you lose turtles, you lose that biomass that is supporting so many other species. But it's also important to know that this is, this is really interesting too, is that females rarely show signs of reproductive senescence. You know, um, in humans, you know, menopause within, within women in, in their, you know, 40s to 50s, uh, many um, animals, female males stop producing uh, at a certain age. Well, turtles, um, there, there are records of turtles that are 100 years old, more or less, that are still laying eggs. So that's why it's so important to have those adults on the, in the population and how if you remove that adult female from the population, even in small amounts, it can have really devastating impacts on the population growth and population recovery because it takes so long to get that female. So how endangered are they? We've heard many different stories and um, I am a freshwater turtle and tortoise biology, biologist, even though I, I have worked with sea turtles, um, but I have been concentrating for the last oh, 25 years on freshwater turtles. But I just wanted to give you a brief idea of just how small some of these populations are so that you can put it into comparison because oftentimes people say, oh, it's critically endangered. It, it, it's not always intuitive. Critically endangered does not mean numbers of how many there are. It's about a whole series of different points of range restriction, uh, how many, how much of the population has shrunk. So you can have a speci speciose turtle, like um, the giant Amazon river turtle. It's critically endangered, but it has this huge distribution and sometimes can produce, you know, these populations can produce one or 2 million hatchlings a year, but it's still 
critically endangered because its range has shrunk and the historical numbers are much, much lower than it used to be. So I'm gonna talk about these quick examples uh, here on that would be your upper left. Um, this is a ma male Batagor affinis. This is the uh, Royal Terrapin or um, Southern River Terrapin. Uh, these are in Cambodia. This is a small population in Cambodia. There are three wild nesting females left. Um, and it, we've been working on this project for 20 years and we have just started releasing turtles and we've released about a hundred um, sub adults back into the wild and we're using um, sonic telemetry, uh, which is an acoustic telemetry to monitor the turtles movement. So we are really on the first steps of rebuilding this population here in Southern um, Cambodia. On your upper right, that is a Burmese star tortoise. Um, when, oh, when I first went to, to Myanmar in 2004, it was considered extinct in the wild. You know, there might be one or two there, so it was kind of functionally extinct, but they had about 200 adults in, in, the, um, in captivity. And we were set about of trying to, to breed these turtles and release, and release them back into the wild. Well, fortunately, um, these turtles are fecund. That means they can lay a lot of eggs and they lay many clutches a year. So um, in the past, 15 years, we've produced over 14,000 tortoises, and we've started putting them back uh, into several different protected areas within Myanmar. And uh, we aim to put them back into almost all protected areas within the turtles uh, natural distribution, which is the central dry zone of, of Myanmar. Um, on your bottom left, now this is, this is one that, that's, uh, you know, it's on the precipice. This is the uh, Yangtze giant soft shell turtle. Uh, Raftus swin Hawaii. Um, it's probably the largest freshwater turtle. It is only now now from uh, a male at a zoo in China and one female in a semi wild lake in Vietnam. And we have been searching for new individuals. And we have a team out right now um, in northern Vietnam uh, trying to trap additional in individuals uh, for years. Uh, we had tried to breed them in China, uh, but unfortunately uh, the uh, female that was part of the breeding program we had in China um, died uh, during a surgical procedure. So that was uh, really a, a, a big step back for us, but we're still not giving up hope. We still are, are working hard. We're using some very novel uh, technology. We're using eDNA, which is environmental DNA, which is looking at bits of pieces in the water to uh, find DNA and track them. And I'm probably running short on time, but um, the bottom right is your Rhodey Island snake neck turtle from a tiny island off of Timor. Um, this is extinct in the wild and we are now returning it to the wild with the first individuals. So my last slide, what can we do? Well, we're working on creating assurance colonies for all the most endangered species to, to, make, to assure that they don't go biologically extinct. And we are in the midst of uh, working on uh, management plans and implementing those plans to ensure that we can recover populations of the rarest turtles across their full um, e ecological role across their former distribution. So for folks that would like some additional information, please uh, go to the Wildlife Conservation Society's webpage, as well as the Turtle Survival Alliance webpage. There's a plethora of information about non-marine turtles, um, our panel has a great deal of really great marine turtle biologists, and I'm sure they will give you additional information as well. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that very interesting intro to Turtles of the World. It's so exciting to hear about some of these international recovery efforts. We really appreciate you being here tonight to share your turtle expertise. Next up, we will hear from Dr. Supraja Darini, who has devoted the last two decades of her life to promoting and affecting sea turtle conservation along the east coast of India. She is a strong believer in the importance of community stewardship of conservation work and leads a team of over 363 committed conservationists spread among 222 coastal communities covering 700 kilometers of her native country of India. She is also an EC50 honoree this year. Take it away whenever you're ready, Supraja. 
Thank you very much, Kelly. It's truly an honor to be able to share my work um, this evening. Um, I thank Explorers Club and uh, Dr. Anne for putting this together. And uh, Kelly, you're doing amazing work. And um, I would like to um, share my experiences with our integrated community-based conservation program. So. Um, it's very important to ensure safe sea turtle migration. So uh, our integrated community-based conservation program, we're protecting the migratory routes of sea turtles along the east coast of India. I was um, uh, inspired and I'm guided by Dr. Jane Goodall when I saw her documentary in 2001, wherein she says each and every individual can make a difference and that set me to start my work and uh, this is uh, and I'm still continuing to be inspired by Dr. Jane Goodall. Um, in the early times when we first started our conservation work we realized that rampant destruction of the ecosystems by the coastal communities was the main reason uh, and it was because of their illiteracy and high poverty level that was the problem for marine conservation. And um, in the early 1970s, we had Dr. Romulus Viteko, who had recorded 100 nests per kilometer. And when we started the work in 2002, we observed that there was only a 10% of the remaining population of the nesting population of the olive ridley sea turtles. So it was very important to protect all the nesting populations of sea turtles along our um, Bay of Bengal East Coast. And uh, this is the area where we work. We work along 700 kilometers along three states of Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, and Odisha. And uh, it's a well-known fact that we have rich seagrass beds and coral reef ecosystem here. And this is the important migratory route for the mass nesting turtles that go to Orissa for mass nesting for their Aribada. So uh, it's a very important migratory corridor. And uh, we believe that uh, working together on an integrated community-based conservation program will be the only uh, way to conserve sea turtles and their habitats, their coastal areas, uh, the dune ecosystems, the seagrass beds, coral reef ecosystems, and the open oceans. So we work jointly with the forest, the fisheries department, the marine police, Indian Coast Guard, and the fishing community youth who work as Sea Turtle Protection Force members, STPF, local community, Heads, commercial and artisanal fishermen, because they are the ones who are interacting with the sea turtles on a daily basis during their fishing activities. We conduct a lot of um, regular education and awareness programs to the community. Being an artist, I use a lot of artwork and visual media to reach the message to the broader section of the community, which also includes children. I always ensure that uh, our message should reach the children because they are the future generations who are going to continue the conservation work. And community participation is very crucial for the integrated community-based conservation program. So this has led to the protection of nesting turtles all along the East Coast where we work, where the community youth who patrol the beaches in the night and early morning Watch over nesting turtles, help in relocating nests that are uh, going to be predated or near under, um, inundated by the tidal areas. And also ensure that any turtles entangled are being released. And we make sure that the local administration and the officials take part in the uh, hatchling release program, thereby their support is there to the community and their involvement is there in the conservation program. It's very important to involve commercial fishermen in the conservation program because sadly, every year we record thousands of turtles which washes ashore dead due to injuries 
caused by their interaction in commercial fishing operations. And uh, so we work regularly with the trawl fishing harbor associations and the trawl fishing uh, association members and workers and help in releasing turtles that are entangled as bycatch and ensure that they are released back into the ocean and uh, getting them to wholeheartedly implement the use of turtle excluder device. Conservation program achievements, some of the success, pro success uh, initiatives since uh, 2002. We have 316 sea turtle protection force members from the community working along the East Coast. We cover 700 kilometers of nesting beach, which is protected by the sea turtle protection force members. And they have been um, supported by the Forest Department of Andhra Pradesh and Orissa, where they're given a small stipend during this breeding season. This has given them regional pride and recognition and um, ensured the continuity of their involvement in the conservation program. We've released many olive ridley green turtles and hawksbill turtles and spinner dolphins through our rehabilitation program and they have been rehabilitated and released back into the sea. Our intensive awareness and outreach programs has ensured the release of thousands of entangled turtles from ghost nets and fishing gear and recently We've been observing the last four or five years, we've been observing huge uh, amount of ghost gear, artisanal fishermen have been observing. So they are ensuring the release of the turtles and uh, retrieving the ghost nets and bringing them back to shore. We have been working this year seriously with the Indian Coast Guard, which is uh, supporting us in the retrieval of ghost nets and the fishermen are have been advised to bring the ghost nets back to shore and we are going to give them a small incentive for bringing back the ghost nets. And the fishermen are taking great pride in involving themselves in the program because they want to um, ensure the, that the migratory corridor of the sea turtles is going to be uh, clean and also take care of their own ecosystem because they understand that their livelihood depends on the well-being of the ocean. Um, we, our tree foundation, sea turtle conservation coordinators, were the proud recipients of the Disney conservation heroes in 2019. Their dedication and perseverance has ensured the success of the integrated community-based conservation program. They are our district coordinators along the three states. And we believe that working together to make a better life is the main uh, mission of C uh, Tree Foundation because all life deserves a chance. Thank you. And uh, if you want to know more about what we are doing, you can click on this YouTube video, which is uh, Amazing Turtle Heroes, which shows the work of our community members who are working as the Sea Turtle Protection Force members. Thank you. I thank uh, Anne once again for putting this program together and the Explorers Club for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Candy. Wow, amazing. The pure breadth and scale of your work, the community involvement and impact is simply astounding. Next, we will hear from Sisa Raman and Scott Tragizer, co-founders of the Creative Conservation Alliance, a Bangladesh-based conservation organization dedicated to the ecological and cultural conservation of Bangladesh's last wild places. Sisa is also a National Geographic Explorer and serves as Regional Vice Chair South Asia of the IUCN SSC or International Union for the Conservation of Nature Species Survival Commission tortoise and freshwater turtle specialist group. Caesar and his work with the Creative Conservation Alliance has previously had the privilege of receiving both the Whitley Award and Future for Nature Award. And he is now honored to accept the Explorers Club's new Explorer Award. Scott is a conservation biologist and photographer who has dedicated his life to protecting species overlooked by others. He is the executive director and president of the Biodiversity Group 
and his award-winning works have gained recognition from the Explorers Club, International League of Conservation Photographers, Royal Geographical Society, IUCN Species Survival Commission, National Geographic, BBC, and more. So the floor is yours, Cesar, whenever you're ready. Hello, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kelly. And thank you, the Explorers Club, for giving me the opportunity today to talk about my work in Bangladesh. So I just- Sorry, uh, Sorry to interrupt you. Don't forget to go to full screen mode. Okay. okay. All right, do you hear? Perfect. My screen? Perfect. All right. So uh, my name is Caesar. I've been working in Bangladesh for the last 10 years. And uh, uh, today I'll talk about uh, the community-based conservation of uh, Asian giant tortoises. And I've been working uh, to save the species and other endangered turtles and tortoises in Bangladesh, uh, together with my partner, Bangladesh Forest Department and Turtle Survival Alliance. So. We have been working uh, to protect uh, at least six different species in Bangladesh, but today I'll focus on uh, Asian giant tortoise, the subspecies Manuria emis fairy, which is uh, very close to my heart. Uh, the species is found, uh, primarily found in, in the tropical wet uh, forest of Southeast Asia, uh, primarily in, in, the, in Bangladesh, Northeast India states of Mizoram, Tipura, Asham, Myanmar and Thailand. Uh, they are critically endangered and they are considered one of the most primitive tortoise species in the world. Uh, they are the largest tortoise in Asia and they can grow up to 80 pounds. And they are the fourth largest tortoise in the world. And they are, Manuria is one of the th only three species that make nest with leaf litter mount. And in Bangladesh, uh, their population is extremely declining and they are considered uh, a functional extinct. So where we work, we work prim primarily in the southeast of Bangladesh in, in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. So Chittagong Hill Tracks is uh, ecologically, culturally and uh, geographically very different from the rest of the country, which is about 10% of the total land mass of Bangladesh. Um, CHT is located in the uh, border of Myanmar and uh, Indian states of Tipura and Mizoram. Uh, we rediscovered a uh, remnant population of Asian giant tortoise in CHT, uh, and, uh, in, particularly in the southeast corner, uh, bordering uh, Arakan and Chin states of Myanmar. And uh, this uh, area is primarily inhabited by 11 uh, indigenous groups, uh, uh, belong to Tibeto Burmese linguistic group. And we documented about 32 globally threatened species in that particular area. And uh, the area is extremely uh, politically unstable. As a reason, there has not been not much work has been done on biodiversity research and conservation. And uh, this area also falls within the Indo-Burma biodiversity hotspot. And we have been working in in the southeast corner of uh, Chittagong Hill Tracks for the last 10 years. Uh, the entire landscape was once covered with lush green tropical uh, mixed evergreen forest, as you can see in the picture on my left. Unfortunately, only about 5% of the original primary forest cover is still surviving. And uh, logging, uh, slash and burn agriculture, and just uh, new uh, development of roads and infrastructure are causing uh, the, ma the main major threats for this forest. And, this is the primary habitat for Asian giant tortoise. Other than for habitat destruction, hunting is also the, one of the major threats for Asian giant tortoise. Uh, we have not documented any uh, presence, evidence of commercial uh, turtle trade, large scale commercial turtle trade in the area, but uh, the chronic subsistence hunting uh, combined with the habitat destruction are causing the species on the brink of extinction. And we documented uh, only one uh, or two localities where the Asian giant tortoises are found. If you can see in, in the picture on my left, I've been, uh, this particular shell on, on the right side has, has been uh, hunted. And fortunately we were able to recover the species on my right. Uh, it's a male Asian giant tortoise that we 
we, we, we transfer to reading center, which I'll talk in a bit. So what we did, uh, first we identified three people and we uh, trained uh, the hunter, we empowered them as parabiologists. Basically, we, we equip them with, uh, uh, with GPS, uh, with cap digital cap point and shoot cameras and calipers, and we trained them uh, to uh, conduct basic ecological survey. And uh, they become the ambassador for uh, conservation in that area. And we give them a monthly salary. And uh, together, uh, for the last five, six years, uh, they have been uh, uh, motivating uh, the people uh, to uh, cease hunting. And, and we rescued over 130 individuals of uh, turtles and tortoises of at least five different species. And more than 100 specimens were released back in the wild. Out of them, we found uh, 10 individuals in the last four, five years, 10 individuals of Asian giant tortoises, which we transferred back to our uh, captive breeding colony. Uh, this is a picture from our uh, Turtle Conservation Center, which was established in 2017 in partnership with Bangladesh Forest Department, which is located in uh, Bhawal National Park, uh, uh, which is 40 kilometers north of the capital city, Dhaka. The major goal of the center is to uh, breed uh, rare tortoises and turtles of Bangladesh and increase their number in captivity for eventual release back in the wild. This is just one part of the work, but we have been also working with the com communities as well. So in the center, we have four species of turtles and tortoises, but I'll focus on Asian giant tortoises. We have uh, three males and seven uh, females uh, we have in our center, and uh, uh, we feed them uh, 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 green vegetables, uh, seasonal fruits, and uh, their breeding season is in around March and April. In fact, right now we are having uh, tortoises nesting in, in our center. And uh, so they make a huge, uh, they make a, they, they gather the leaf litter on the forest floor and they make a mound and then they lay eggs, about um, 40 to 80 eggs. And it takes about uh, uh, 60 to 80 days for the, uh, for the eggs to hatch out. And we place the eggs in the incubator in the center. We put the temperature about 28 to 29 degrees Celsius. And uh, for the first time, we, uh, we bred Asian giant tortoises in Bangladesh in 2019. In the first year, we had uh, 46 hatch hatchlings survived, uh, 46 hatchlings. And in uh, last year, we had about 56 hatchlings. Uh, I was talking about the one aspect of the program on the captive breeding, but I'll give a brief overview of our uh, community work. So uh, our eventual goal is to release those uh, captive bred orders back in the wild. So uh, incentivizing the communities to uh, cease hunting uh, and consumption of tortoises are, are, are the key, uh, cru very crucial for the reintroduction and the long-term survival of the species in, in that area. So uh, we are working with 10 villages and uh, we, uh, over the years, we have built rapport with the communities and we asked them like, how can we together protect the species? And they ask us like, uh, they need schools, uh, their kids uh, need support. So we initially provided about three uh, primary schools, uh, 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 which covers, which provide the free primary education service for about 10 villages and cover about 100 students uh, per year getting uh, a free education. And we we also provide uh, basic uh, education materials for the kids and we provide uh, salaries for the school teachers. And and and, and we also have uh, the local parabiologist and we that incentivizing the communities to demarcate their particular areas within within uh, adjacent to their villages for protection of tortoises. This is one example of one of the community forests that uh, uh, we have been restoring and we plan to further uh, plant uh, native species of trees uh, to restore the area for, uh, for uh, tortoises and other species. So uh, in fact, we uh, are using the turtles, the tortoises as a flagship species for initiating ecological restoration in the area. You see in the picture on, on my left, which was about taken in 2015, and the, on the right, you can clearly see some change in the forest cover. 
So moving forward, uh, this year we in, we plan to initiate uh, the first uh, pilot reintroduction of Asian giant tortoise in Bangladesh, and we have already uh, had a, a agreement with about five villages, and they agreed uh, uh, they would protect the tortoises because without uh, the involvement of the communities are very uh, difficult uh, to protect the species. Uh, Top-down approach would not be, not, would not work in that region. And uh, we plan to release uh, 10 individuals fitted with radio transmitter and the tortoises will be uh, uh, monitored for over at least for two years to understand the survival ship. And, and uh, the program will, uh, this pilot program will enable us to uh, equip us with knowledge for a long-term uh, large scale uh, reintroduction around the landscape. So thank you very much. Uh, that was it. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you so much, Caesar. And now if we can play the video from Scott, that would be great. Hey, everybody. Pull up a chair. I'm going to talk to you about one of the most interesting conservation stories I've heard of yet. This is Trapped Souls, Turtles of the Shrine. And a little bit about myself really quick. I'm the co-founder and director of the Creative Conservation Alliance. It's a nonprofit that works in Bangladesh to conserve its last wild places. I'm a member of the IUCN Species Specialist Commission for Tortoises and Freshwater Turtles. I'm a director, executive director and president of the uh, Biodiversity Group. It's a nonprofit that works to conserve life overlooked species that other organizations are ignoring in novel and interesting ways. I'm also a member of the Explorers Club since 2018 and a member of the International League of Conservation Photographers. So you'll see a lot of my photos during this presentation. And now for the backstory. There was once a Muslim Sufi mystic named Bayezid Bastami. He, on his pilgrimage, had visited Chittagong, Bangladesh. It's a city in the southeast. Uh, legend has it he died there. And um, in eight, so in 850 AD, a tomb was erected. And uh, in about 1500 AD, a Muslim mosque was erected around this tomb. It's now a sacred site and visited by hundreds, if not thousands, of followers every day. And now you can see what this has to do with turtles. There's several hundred of these critically endangered black soft-shell turtles, Nelsonia nigricans, trapped in this pond. Uh, why are they trapped? Well, this is where it gets interesting. So Baizid Bastami, on his pilgrimage, brought a lot of his followers with him. Uh, Unfortunately, they disobeyed him at some point. I'm not sure what the actual uh, disobedience was, but it was somehow deserving of them to be cursed for all eternity to spend, spend their lives as these turtles. So they're considered supernatural beings, sacred, and they live out their lives in this pond, and perhaps they're going to be trapped there forever? Maybe not. But wait, there's more. Twist. He actually probably never came to Bangladesh in the first place. So this is such a mysterious legend uh, and the turtles simply are there and this is where the conservation now comes into play. Now I mentioned they're critically endangered. These are actually were considered to be extinct in the wild for many years and now we know that there's still a handful that can be found in the wild but the primary populations are it's it's here in Chittagong in this Pastami shrine and also one in Assam, India. Now he wouldn't think of it, but this actually, this, this religious uh, place of religious worship has acted as an, uh, one of the best assurance colonies you could ask for for this species. Without this shrine, you know, we would have far fewer of these animals in existence. So that's great. But the problem is they're not really safe anymore. Uh, the pollution in this pond is, is heinous. Uh, you can see, if you look at the turtle, you can see the pink on its skin. That's all ammonia burn. Um, and on top of that, the, there's giant fish and like snakeheads in this pond that eat all the babies that come out. So there is no, there is no recruitment into adulthood. And there's been local persecution against these turtles. There's been, uh, they tried to poison the turtles. Luckily they, they failed, but, and they could poison them again. So they're not that safe anymore. Um, and furthermore, the place where they actually take the turtles and put them into a wheelbarrow and move them into a really makeshift uh, nesting colony or nesting area. And, now, and then they nest, they lay some eggs pour in a poor, poorly uh, regulated area. And so the dogs eat it, they burn up. And so this basically it's, these turtles are alive, but they're not breeding. And so they eventually will all die. And that's, that's where we're coming in. 
Now, luckily, there was some legwork done before we got into this by people like uh, the organization Turtle Island or Karanam, and it allowed us to get access to this to the shrine to start helping them help their turtles. Uh, they didn't know how, and they also thought it was up to God. They thought it was all up to God. If the God wanted them to die, then they would. And we quickly convinced them in 2019 that uh, that wasn't the case, that uh, we can use science to help these turtles. And we created incubators for them, started at, we hatched out a pilot, uh, a pilot um, cohort, released them back into the pond, posterity. And then next, the, the next year, 2020, we ended up breeding a whole lot more. So 240 in total. And that would have been a lot more if it wasn't for the pandemic. So now everyone's really happy. This is, this is really moving forward. Uh, we even constructed a, a hatchling uh, pond on site so they're not getting eaten by the fish anymore because that first release probably just got eaten by, by fish pretty much instantly. And, um, and we're finally in discussion with the, with the shrine authorities to possibly have an assurance colony. Now, they somewhat have a monopoly on, this, uh, on these turtles insofar that the people come to the shrine to pay homage to the shrine, but also to the turtles. And then they, they make some revenue selling bananas to feed the turtles, etc., um, but they also know that their turtles are very much in danger and that their business model won't last long if, if they all die. And now moving forward, thanks to all that legwork by us and others, we, we have some pretty lofty goals. We want to hatch out at least 500 of these per year, maybe even a thousand or more. Uh, and what are we going to do with those though? Well, we want to set up an assurance colony. We have a turtle uh, conservation center over in Bawal National Park. It's in the north of Dhaka in the capital city where we breed other species of tortoises and turtles. Uh, we can bring these over there and, and keep them and safeguard them. So there are two sites within Bangladesh. If anything happens to that one site, then we, we the species isn't essentially lost. Um, now, together, we can then breed and there's you could have so many turtles breeding or so many hatchlings coming out that there's no room in that pond for them. So logically, the next best thing to do is to put them back into the wild where they belong over in, in somewhere in this Brahmaputra River Basin. So it's a it's a large river coming down into Bangladesh and there's plenty of habitat that we can throw them into. But obviously that costs a lot of money too and there's logistical issues. So if you're ever wanting to help out with this very incredibly interesting project, check out the Creative Conservation Alliance, conservationalliance.org, links up here. Um, and if you want to see any more of my photos or anything, you can go to naturestills.com or follow me on Instagram at Scott Trace for photo. And that's all I got for you. Hope you enjoyed it. Wow, Cesar and Scott, the work of the Creative Conservation Alliance in bringing communities and science together to protect habitats and species can be an example and a model for other growing NGOs around the world. I can't wait to hear more about the longer term results of the breeding programs as well. So before we move on, I wanna share a positive comment from the audience. Um, Edie Aranjis Edith said that she works uh, with the Manoria Emmys Emmys at the Ashton Biological Preserve in Florida. And she says, amazing work, Dr. Darini and Cesar and Scott. So just a reminder to those of you in the audience tonight, don't forget to be sending in your questions. So next, it is my pleasure to introduce Fabian Cousteau and Pamela Fletcher. Fabian, grandson of Jacques Cousteau, is an aquanaut, oceanographic explorer, environmental advocate, and founder of the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center. Early in 2016, he founded the Ocean Learning Center to fulfill his dream of creating a vehicle to make positive change in the world. He has received several awards, including the United Nations Nexus Global Goals Award for Excellence in Leadership, the David Attenborough Excellence in Filmmaking Award, the Golden Eagle Award, the Beneath the Sea Diver of the Year, the Peter Benchley Lifetime Award, and the World Team Pioneer for the Planet Award. Pamela Fletcher uh, began working in marine conservation in Nicaragua in 2005 during her Fulbright Scholarship. Since 2018, she has been coordinating the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center Nicaragua Sea Turtle Program. And tonight she will share some background and information about the program. So take it away, Fabian, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Callie, great to see you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here at the Explorers Club event and to see so many distinguished folks doing such great work around the world. 
Uh, as far uh, as I'm concerned, as you mentioned, um, I'm a third generation ocean explorer. Uh, we've been doing this uh, since the uh, early 1940s, uh, starting with my grandfather, and uh, have had a, an addiction to uh, the ocean and our, our little oasis in space uh, from a very young age. I've been scuba diving since I was four and on expeditions routinely since I was seven. So in many ways, um, that was my classroom growing up. And uh, being a, a storyteller, being someone uh, that has had the honor of being in some of the remote, most remote places in the world, mingling with cultures uh, that I've learned a great deal from, uh, from the legends, including le uh, legends of sea turtles, to the very real underpinnings of what makes those communities function uh, and their interrelationship with our uh, little oasis in space, a little aquatic environment. Uh, it really gave me a great appreciation uh, for all sorts of things out there and also the great disconnect that we often have as a species with our life support system. And so uh, beyond uh, creating documentaries, which of course uh, is a little uh, insight into some of these adventures, I wanted to be able to offer a platform where we could go and do better, go and connect with those local communities and offer uh, a, a, an ability to work together uh, for a brighter tomorrow. And the Ocean Learning Center is based around three core principles, see, learn, and do. Uh, and with that said, it's about uh, empowerment, education, and of course, proactive movement. Uh, ultimately, of course, uh, we aim to be, or at least my philosophy is to aim to be obsolete. What do I mean by that? Well, we're a nonprofit. And by that, uh, we should be able to be successful enough to not be needed anymore. And so whenever we go into a community, whether it's for coral restoration through 3D printing, or whether it's planting mangroves uh, or seagrasses or what have you, beach cleanups and all that, it's the, the, the idea is to be able to give the tools necessary for that local community, be it in the United States or in some of the farthest reaches of the world, for example, Nicaragua, whereby the local people can be their own champions and they don't need us anymore. And so it's with great pleasure that uh, I've had the opportunity to dive with sea turtles, to see turtles, uh, to see land-based uh, turtles, uh, tortoises uh, up the Amazon River and other places. And the importance that they play, not only as a, a vital source for the community itself, both in legend and in food sources, but also as an integral uh, gardener of the sea, for example, and other roles that they must play in order to have a viable ecosystem. And for us to be able to address the problems that we face today, we must have an understanding of what the fundamental issue is. And with regard to El Salvador or Nicaragua, it's about addressing the needs of the local people and uh, educating them in the very uh, fundamental sciences that makes sea turtles so unbelievable, uh, unbelievably interesting. Sea turtles are amazing for many reasons, uh, as are land turtles. And uh, with that, uh, I don't want to over speak and take too much of my time. I'd rather pass the baton to someone I've been working with and have great admiration for and is one of our Ocean Learning Center uh, managers, uh, Dr. Pamela Fletcher and her husband, Martin, who have been thankfully uh, helping us so vehemently with the local community of uh, women in Nicaragua, and they've been making an amazing bit of progress. So with that, I'd like to pass it on to Pamela. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Callie and Fabian for a very nice introduction. And I hope that this finds all of you Explorer Club members safe and healthy. I actually wasn't sure I was gonna be here tonight. So I have a recorded presentation that Callie, I, I'd like to hand over to you to make sure that that can play. If it's gonna play, then we're good. And I'll pop back in after we're done. Thank you, Fabian, for a really nice introduction. And another thank you goes out to the Explorers Club 
for inviting us here to present information about the Nicaragua Sea Turtle Program on World Turtle Day. So thank you. The Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center, or FCOLC, was founded in 2016 in New York, and the nonprofit organization has three primary focus areas. They are awareness, educate, and empower. You'll also see them listed as see, learn, and do. The center supports local communities as champions of marine conservation, restoration, and research. Working with the communities means meeting them where they are. Anytime we can, we try to get out into the environment and really work with people monitoring sea turtle nests and going through these experiences. So we've got that see, learn, and do activity that really connects us to nature and to one another to empower then take this knowledge and use it for empowerment of making positive change. Everyone plays a role in protecting the ocean and the FCOLC is actively educating and engaging humankind by using science and building passion to motivate positive change now. And now is the time to take action to protect, conserve, and ensure the health of our vast ocean for the future. So let's talk some more about turtles. Over 10 years ago, Fabian embarked on restoring sea turtle populations in El Salvador. The project included rescuing sea turtle eggs that had been poached and placing them into hatcheries. In addition, there were alternative livelihood projects that would occur, things like ecotourism or handicrafts that could be sold to boost the economy and really helped build the success of this program. Currently, the FCOLC has a sea turtle program in Nicaragua. So this is the Pacific coast of Nicaragua. And this project really is based on several years of working with the local community. Fabian had yet another adventure in this country, and it first started with monitoring and rehabilitation of a mangrove forest that had been impacted by a tropical storm. So the FCOLC has a relationship with this community, which was really, really helpful in that concept, again, of the awareness, the educate and empower. So there's already this awareness of marine conservation and wise stewardship of resources. And so that learning component, what's new here is sea turtle monitoring. It's, it's brand new to the local community here, but it is now the focal point of the FCOLC's effort in this region. The project includes sea turtle conservation and empowering women and youth, especially young girls in this area, to start to see science and STEM education as something that they can pursue. So that see, learn, and do theme, raising global awareness through education and experiential learning and empowering the communities was really evident from the inception of this program. And in the fall of 2019, there was a sea turtle center that was created. So it now acts as that hub where people know where to go to learn about sea turtles, to build their knowledge about science if they wanna learn some more about how do we actually monitor sea turtles, whether it's flipper tags or measuring sea turtles or counting the eggs and looking at hatching success. So there's now been a real opportunity to combine that science with engaging the community and empowering people to make change. So things like having an ecotourism company may be possible for these women and these young girls in this area. Here you can see the project site. So we are talking about Nicaragua in Central America. There's a couple of inset maps that you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. And it shows you the Republic of Nicaragua, which is highlighted. And then it shows you within the state of Nicaragua, in the Northwest region, you can see one of the counties, that is Leon, and that is where the Isla Juan Venado Nature Reserve exists. The reserve was declared by the government in 1983, and it's got approximately 22 kilometers of shoreline. So this is our really important area for sea turtle nesting. In addition, it does have mangroves. So you can see on the satellite map on the right hand side, there's a lot of tree cover in this area. So this combination of the shoreline with the forest 
and these buffer zones, both in the marine and the terrestrial side, all comprise the study site, the Isla Juan Bonato Nature Reserve. The success of this program thus far really is based on the collaborative nature of the groups that have been involved, both in the sea turtle program and in the prior mangrove reforestation. So what we have are right now, the focus is women and young girls who are involved and they are right from the community. About 2000 people live in the area of Las Pinitas. So one of the little villages that we interact with. And also there's an indigenous community that has been participating from mangrove reforestation again now to the sea turtle conservation. The local university, which is about a half an hour away, there's students who are conducting research, some young ladies that have gotten involved to do different research projects looking at hatching success or malformations of some of the little baby sea turtles in addition to government entities. So the mayor's office or the Ministry of the Environment, all of these groups have really been working together now for a couple of years with sea turtles to build the program. And I'd like to say that not one of us could do it without the other. It really is this collaborative nature of all of us working together to achieve very specific goals that have been laid out. Project planning is very important. The project has several themes. Of course, there is research that's involved in learning more about the sea turtle population in this area, the nesting females, the hatching success, and then also looking more at capacity building. So what is that research, that science that might be imparted to women and young girls so that they could pursue an environmental science career? But even if they're not interested in a science career, is there an opportunity for business, you know, entrepreneurial skills that could be learned? So not just focused on the sea turtles alone, but if there were an ecotourism company or project management just in general, so building capacity. And then the fact that these women and young girls are getting to know one another and building a relationship in support of one another as they move through the um, different social and economic barriers that are, are seen in this area. Sea turtle monitoring and conservation. What are the impacts from a project such as this? They include having over 28,000 eggs from four different species of sea turtles that have been laid in this Isla Wandanado Nature Reserve relocated into a hatchery that would have guards 24 seven, so no poaching, and just also just the monitoring of the nest. And of those 28,000, we had over 21,000 that hatched and got returned to the ocean. So hopefully we'll be seeing them back in some time, come back to our, our nesting beaches. And in addition, there were 360 flipper tags that were uh, attached to the sea turtle. So this is the first time that We've got some tags that we can look and track how many times a nesting female returns to the beach. So we're starting to learn more about this nesting population of sea turtles in the area. So those are your sea turtle monitoring and conservation impacts. And here is an image of an olive ridley. This sea turtle laid her nest and is headed back to the ocean. But before she gets in that water, the sea turtle team tried to work up some numbers. So they're looking at her size, her weight, and when possible, they apply a flipper tag and that allows us to track movement. So if she comes back and lays another nest during the nesting season, whether it's this year or uh, sometime in the future, and she still has that tag on, we know that she's come back and she's laid another nest. And so it's also a way for us to track any growth or impacts to her. We can see how she's doing. So in this region, due to poaching and consumption of sea turtle eggs, what occurs is a relocation of a nest. So if there's a sea turtle nest that's laid down in one portion of the beach, it typically is moved into a hatchery so that it can be guarded 24 seven and monitored. So very careful process of moving the eggs into that hatchery and then monitoring for success. And here you can see some olive ridley sea turtles heading to the ocean for the first time after they've hatched out of their nest. 
Project impacts related to empowering women and girls in the area include having full time. There are 22 individuals from the community, women and girls from the community who participate throughout the entire sea turtle nesting season, in addition to planning and reporting. So they are involved in the project for a significant portion of the year. In addition, there are some part time participants. These are again females and whether they're students or local community members. So there are nine students and seven community members. And so one student might be leading their own research and another student from the biology department might be helping them collect data and information. In addition to that, there are large events that are held in the city of Leon, so moving inland and getting to a greater population. Over 100 students, mostly girls, have participated in some of these sea turtle awareness days that we've held and also other activities that we've held in the community, more workshop based. But those are some of the impacts as they relate to empowering women and young girls. Here you can see the project team, they're getting together, they're either doing a beach cleanup or they're preparing the sea turtle hatchery before the season. So they are interacting quite often with one another. Again, that sense of community and that network to help one another out in addition to taking care of the sea turtles and monitoring them in this area. Here you see a few of the participants that are releasing sea turtles. So if there was a hatch out in the nursery, then they go and they bring them to the shore and they release those sea turtles. One of the most powerful things that I have found are the testimonials from participants. So here you can see Anna and Ariseli. They are very active in the program. These are two of the full-time participants and the impact that this has on them personally and then also in the community. They are viewed as leaders in the community. They are learning science. They are learning about business. And so all of those pieces of information, going back to awareness, educate and empower, these women really have had their lives changed by this project. It's, uh, it's really amazing when you are on the ground working side by side with them, you have really changed their lives Here are a few more testimonials from the younger participants that are involved in the project. And you can see impact. When we start talking about impact, you have somebody who wants to take care of animals when they grow up, look at veterinarian school, or somebody who wants to be a marine biologist. So those life-changing instances that have occurred by a project like this, and they not only help preserve, protect, and conserve our marine and coastal resources, but it also is changing the lives of these individuals that are participating in the effort. So big thank you to the Explorers Club for the opportunity for the FCOLC to be able to present information to both about women empowerment and sea turtles on our World Turtle Day. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Fabian and Pamela, for sharing your expansive community-based conservation work and woman empowerment work with us. Those numbers of protecting 28,000 eggs from illegal harvest and releasing around 21,000 hatchlings safely to the sea are simply massive. So before I continue, I just want to say that we have people from all around the world tuning in tonight, including Papua New Guinea and South Africa. So ultimately, as the last speaker this evening, I would like to take a few minutes to talk about the conservation of the largest sea turtle species, the leatherback sea turtle, and the most illegally trafficked sea turtle species, the hawksbill sea turtle. So just let me share my screen. So by studying these sea turtle species and the threats that are facing their survival, we can open the doors to conversations about some of the greatest threats facing our oceans today, including climate change, pollution, habitat destruction, overfishing, the illegal wildlife trade, and fisheries bycatch. 
So to start with a little bit of background on the leatherback sea turtle, as their name implies, this species has a soft shell. They are part and the only surviving member of an ancient family of sea turtles called the Dermochelidae, or the skin-shelled turtles. Leatherbacks are the largest turtle in the world and they can weigh up to 2,050 pounds. The largest individual ever found was about 10 feet long, but on average, they measure between six and seven feet. Leatherbacks have the widest distribution of any reptile on the planet. This is both geographical and also thermal. They are the only species of sea turtles that can withstand non-tropic water temperatures. Leatherbacks can dive deeper than some whale species, up to 1,300 meters, or about 4,265 feet deep, uh, which is about the depth of 14 football fields stacked on top of each other. This footage was taken by a National Geographic critter camera, and through watching the footage, we can learn more about leatherback behavior. Leatherbacks also can eat their weight in jellyfish every day. Uh, this characteristic makes them a keystone species as they play a role in controlling jellyfish populations and supporting healthy fish stocks. I started working with leatherbacks in 2015, and in 2019, I started the Leatherback Project to focus on combating the greatest threat facing leatherback survival in the East Pacific Ocean, so from Mexico to Chile, uh, which is fisheries bycatch. Leatherbacks can only hold their breath for around 80 minutes, and gill nets can be set for as many as 24 hours in many parts of Latin America. In the East Pacific Ocean, leatherbacks are critically endangered and they've experienced a decline of over 98% in the last 30 years. Approximately 87% of the sea turtle fisheries bycatch in the Southeast Pacific occurs in Ecuador alone, which equates to about 40,500 turtles of all species every year. The Leatherback Project is composed of approximately 40 local biologists, fishermen, and university student volunteers working along the coast of Ecuador to test and promote sustainable fisheries practices. One way that we can reduce fisheries bycatch is to use something called bycatch reduction technology, which creatively exploits the differences in the sensory capabilities between the target species of a fishery and the non-target and usually endangered species. Green LED lights, for example, have been shown to decrease the bycatch of sea turtles anywhere from 40 to 81% without significantly affecting target fish catch. And a new study just came out that observed a 93% decrease in sea turtle bycatch with the use of purple LED lights. Sea turtles can see the green light just like we can, but the target species, which are typically bony fish species, can't. So their behavior is completely unaffected. Now we are working with the Ministry of Production, Foreign Trade, Investments, and Fisheries of Ecuador, the National Fisheries Institute, as well as Mundo Ecológico, local fisheries cooperatives, local university students, and two technology companies called Safety Net Technologies and Fish Tech Marine to test these green LED lights and purple LED lights within the Ecuadorian artisanal gillnet fishery. A benefit of collaborating across societal sectors and directly with the government is that we can make sure that our results are promptly utilized in the implementation of this bycatch reduction technology throughout the entire country. We are also um, monitoring over 30 kilometers of Ecuador's coastline to document stranding events of sea turtles and evidence of fisheries interactions. This activity only started weekly in September of 2020, and we have already documented over 400 individuals of threatened or endangered species, including cetaceans, sharks, and four different species of sea turtles. These data allow us to prove the severity of this issue to government agencies. Another part of our work is collaborating with fishermen to document bycatch and release events. These release videos are more evidence that we can use to show that bycatch is a serious issue and also a way that we can create a community of fishermen that are excited to be partaking in the safeguarding of this important species. 
Just before the pandemic began in the Americas, I returned from a pilot research expedition through a National Geographic Society Early Career Grant to the Pearl Islands Archipelago in Panama to find new leatherback sea turtle nesting and foraging grounds, and also to evaluate local threats to turtles. This was also a flag expedition through the Explorers Club and Wings World Quest. We unexpectedly discovered new critically endangered Hawksville sea turtle foraging and nesting habitat, and also uncovered a stronghold of the illegal wildlife trade of turtle shell, meat, and eggs in Panama. Hawksville sea turtles are critically endangered globally, and they're valued in the illegal wildlife trade for their shells. Artisans use the shells to craft spurs for cockfighting, jewelry, combs, and other decorative pieces. In the Pearl Islands, Hawksville shell is primarily utilized to make spurs for weekly cockfighting events, but other parts of Hawksbills and other turtle species are also highly valued, such as the meat and eggs. Turtle oil as a remedy for lung problems and also turtle penis as an aphrodisiac. Our activities in the Pearl Islands, monitoring nesting beaches and conducting surveys on fisheries bycatch and turtle use, employed local community members, providing conservation jobs to individuals that previously harvested endangered species for sustenance. We are now working with the Minister of the Environment and the Army Navy to develop a comprehensive plan to mitigate this threat to endangered marine turtle species in the Pearl Islands archipelago and also throughout Panama. So I quickly just wanna take a, a minute to thank our generous donors and sponsors and share our contact information and social channels. If you'd like to reach out, support us, get involved or follow along. And now it's time for a Q and A. So let's see. Our first question is for, let's just bring it up here. Our first question is for Brian. Um, someone from the audience is wondering out of all of your time in the field in various parts of the world, do you have a most memorable turtle sighting encounter or interaction that you would like to share with us? Oh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, I feel very lucky. Um, there's, there's just a, a, a few of my friends that we, we have this list that we um, see a, we, about the number of rare turtles that we've seen in, in the wild. And um, I'll, I'll take it back. Um, you know, I think I was, uh, I was 20, 21 years old and I was working in Austin, Costa Rica on the, the Olive Ridley turtles. And I had really wanted to see this little wood turtle uh, that I knew was in the streams behind the, the nesting area. And I spent every day looking for it, looking for it, and looking for it. And I finally found it. It's a beautiful little red colored wood turtle. And that, that made my day. I think that that's a very powerful memory for me. Sounds like it was a formative one and, yeah. and maybe inspiring your career too. <laughs> so, okay. Another question from the audience. Um, this could be maybe for CSAR. Uh, they're wondering about how much it costs to run these hatchery programs for different endangered turtle species. So uh, our one is uh, not... Uh, basically, a conservation breeding facility. We have about uh, four species of turtles, about 100 individuals at the moment. So it costs about monthly expenses like uh, $2,000 US dollar per month, including uh, food for turtles, salary for managers, and, and caretakers. Yes. Wow. So it's not cheap to do this kind of work, is it? Conservation is expensive. It is. Um, okay, so another question from the audience. Do turtles communicate with each other? Does anyone want to comment on that one? Go ahead, Brian. Um, very interestingly, um, there have been some new evidence that shows uh, turtles are vocalizing. Um, they've seen it in a number of species. It was first described in Australia and now uh, Camilla Ferrero in Brazil is, um, she has some incredible papers out where she's 
traveled the world looking at uh, vocalizations of turtles and even seeing that hatchlings within the nest are chirping. So there is some evidence that turtles do make sounds um, and whether or not it's true communication is one thing, but they are definitely vocalizing. I was actually reading about that and they are saying that the chirping is to help with the synchronization of the hatching event, right? Just so that yes. the hatchings are all coming out from the nest at the same time so they can overwhelm predators. Just pretty amazing how, how that has developed over time. Okay, so Praja, the next question is for you. Um, the audience is wondering, how are you planning to involve the community in protecting sea turtles at sea? Or if you could go into more detail about that. Okay, so um, protecting sea turtles at sea is something that we've been doing the last few years. And this year, due to the pandemic, we are going to seriously intensify this work. Uh, so we have uh, we are working on creating an uh, intensive outreach and awareness programs to the coastal uh, artisanal and the commercial trawl fishermen, wherein during their fishing uh, activities, if they encounter any uh, ghost nets or ghost gear, they have to retrieve the nets and bring it back to the shore. And we are having a, a, a protocol for collecting those nets. And uh, we are going to give them a small incentive of uh, five rupees per kilo. So they will uh, bring it back to us. And uh, we are thinking, we have not yet thought of what to do with the um, retrieve nets, but we thought first we will initiate this program. Uh, we are initiating the program from the 1st of June this year, that is in a few days time. And um, the base work has already uh, begun. And uh, so the fishermen are very interested in, and enthusiastic about this program because they've all been telling us that they have seen a lot of ghost gear whenever they are going uh, fishing. Uh, but uh, our Sea Turtle Protection Force members, whenever they see turtles entangled in ghost nets, they cut the net, release the turtles, take photographs, bad photos, good videos, and then they bring them back. It's a record and they are retrieving the nets. But the other fishermen, only when it's small, it's um, less than 100 kilos, they bring it back. But if it's larger than that, they just leave it. And uh, we've been telling them that if you leave it there, it's going to keep on trapping marine life. So you have to bring it back. It's not just for the sea turtles, but to keep the migratory corridor safe for the rest of the turtles and other endangered species, but also to stop trapping other marine life for years. And uh, we have explained to them that they have to take pride in keeping their marine ecosystem clean for future generations. And that's how we've taken the program forward. And it's mostly the uh, sea turtle conservation coordinators of the respective districts and the sea turtle protection force members of every village who are going to take this program forward. Just like how Fabian said, um, we want the community to uh, take responsibility of continuing the program so that the children will take over. Already our Sea Turtle Protection Force members are role models in their respective villages. So the youth and the children will continue the program into the future, even beyond our lifetime. So this is how we've planned it. And we are working jointly with the Indian Coast Guard and HCL, Hindustan uh, Computers Limited is supporting us in this conservation program. Wow. Um, it's really incredible, just the breadth of the community involvement that you've been able to foster in India with all different, um, the fishery sector, local communities, the children, it's, it's really amazing. Um, it's super inspiring. Um, I'd love to talk more about how I can yes. apply these types of strategies in Ecuador as well with our Leatherback Project work. So the next question is for you, Fabian. It's from Luna. Uh, how can we recruit and educate locals from other countries to become leaders in conservation like you and Dr. Fletcher? Perhaps we can imitate the franchise idea in business. <laughs> That's a great question, Luna. Um, you know, first, uh, you need to be able to engage the, the, the person, the individual, as well as the community in a way that, uh, that makes them feel like they're part of the solution. Uh, it's, it's not always easy because 
every community is different. Every need for every community is different. Uh, but certainly uh, in order for uh, the efforts that are represented here on tonight's event uh, to be successful, uh, we all need to pitch in and we all need to become more conservation minded. Uh, and whether that's uh, someone who's going to become or uh, is a marine biologist or an accountant or a business person, at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we talk about costs, but these aren't costs. These, these are investments. These are investments in our future, uh, be it uh, for-profit or non-profit. The, the idea of living with the planet rather than on it is one that uh, is generations and, and uh, old and, and transcends many cultures, but one that we've often forgotten. We've forgotten the lesson that uh, we are just one part of the ecosystem and for us to survive and thrive, our ecosystem needs to as well. So that's uh, a very long winded of saying, yes, of course, uh, to, to replicate uh, is not necessarily always the, the, the right approach simply because a, a cookie cutter approach doesn't necessarily work everywhere. But uh, to be able to have programs that really reach the local people who do need to be part of the solution and who can be and who are the best place to be part of the solution, uh, absolutely. Uh, modify uh, as, as needs be and uh, we'll get out of this. I, I'm very confident of this, especially with people as curious and as enthusiastic as you are, Luna, and many others out there. I love that, that we need to remember as a key takeaway that we are part of nature. So the next question is for you, Dr. Fletcher. Um, what is one benefit that the Nicaragua program provides in support of World Turtle Day and improving awareness of turtles globally? So there's so many things, but you know, you saw the highlights in the presentation and I have to say for World Turtle Day, just the awareness of how important sea turtle species are globally is really a huge impact. And then this connection of people with their environment, right? They are part of the solution. Let's look at the positives and say that they're a part of the solution and for them to be involved pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis for those full-time staff is that they are seeing the fruits of their efforts, their learning, their building capacity. Again, it's the science education component, especially for young ladies and women, but there's this business side of the independence and that network that were emphasized in the presentation. So for, for me, that's my wish. And um, I know that they are planning events for World Turtle Day down there, so they're all excited. And it really has brought a sense of community to this small fishing village of Las Penitas. So they're super excited and they're, they're doing their part. And for us here in, for me in the United States or other areas, I think we all can play a role, whether it's a beach that you're living next to and, and helping with sea turtle nesting or tortoises inland, freshwater streams and water is connecting us all. There's a role that we all can play. But for Nicaragua, I think you've got all of that information in the presentation. I'm happy to talk more about it, but you got the key points. Awesome, this, it's really so inspiring. Uh, it's just amazing to be here with all of you sharing the space, talking about turtles and celebrating World Turtle Day. Um, so our next question comes from Martha Shaw, and it could be from anyone. Um, how can the trade markets for turtles be stopped or combated? If anyone has any thoughts on that. Go ahead, Brian. Well, the, the first thing is stop buying. Um, and I think if we, if the general public stops buying, there's, um, there's no incentive to sell. Uh, and I think that's really important is that, you, you know, I've been in markets uh, around the globe and it's either it's meat or eggs or, or curios or whatnot. Um, you see things sold to tourists, you think things sold to um, local communities. And it's just, you have to have um, people to stop buying. And then the other really true thing is that the um, punishments uh, for these wildlife crimes really truly has to be at a level that shows the damage they've done to our natural world. Uh, destroying a species shouldn't be, you know, a hundred dollar fine and probation. It should be a lot more. And um, 
I think that's really what we need to do. We need to work with our lawmakers and our and our, our politicians to really press that wildlife crime is just as serious as selling drugs, selling arms, um, and creating truly heinous crimes against nature. So, um, so yes, that's how I, I think would be the best step forward. But stop buying is the, the critical part. Go ahead, Fabian. Sorry, yeah, uh, uh, just a quick story uh, about, uh, since we're talking about sea turtles tonight, about El Salvador. Uh, when we first got into El Salvador, uh, the, uh, the sale of sea turtle eggs uh, on the market was legal. One of the things as an individual that I was asked to do was to help change uh, that by petitioning the government to make it illegal. Uh, the, the problem is that that in its, itself is not the solution. Uh, yes, it's part of the solution, of course. Uh, but uh, by, by doing this, you cause another problem, which is that the local uh, fishermen and local people who are dependent on this for part of their income are now being um, limited even further to providing for their family. So instead of vilifying and throwing the local fishermen in jail, which are the most uh, disadvantaged uh, group in El Salvador specifically, uh, we decided to engage at least on our 34 miles of, of beach, uh, 34 kilometers, I'm sorry, of beach that we had been given to manage uh, along with the, the, local, uh, the local communities. Uh, we decided to engage them in um, what they know how to do, which is how to find the sea turtle nests and eggs. And instead of poaching them and selling them on the black market, risking getting thrown in jail, which only furthers uh, the problem for them, uh, we uh, engaged them in what they know how to do, paid them a less than what the black market would offer them, but offered them a way to provide for their family without getting thrown in jail. Now that's an interim solution, that's a bridge solution. The ultimate uh, uh, ending to that story is that in the meantime, we offered them coursework and classwork in alternate sources of income so that they didn't have to rely on the uh, eggs of the sea turtles that were nesting on their beaches, all five endangered species. So that, that now, not only are they learning to conserve and uh, learning the importance of sea turtles to the general ecosystem and ecotourism and all that, but they don't have to depend on that source to provide for their families and risk being thrown in jail or find uh, fines that they can't even pay. So we're happy to say that you know we've stepped away from that. Obviously, we're there if they need us. But at the end of the day, in three years, they were able to release over seven hundred and fifty thousand baby sea turtle eggs uh, nest. Uh, babies. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we check in on a regular basis and they're still providing for themselves through craft, through ecotourism, through hospitality, through all sorts of other avenues that have been offered since then uh, because of the layout of that particular program. So it, it just, it, it, there's a solution to everything. It's just a matter of finding the root cause and addressing that. Supraja. Um. In the areas where we were working, uh, in Tamil Nadu, the children used to take up all the, dig up all the turtle nests, and they used to play with the uh, eggs, use them like balls to play cricket, and they threw it on each other's uh, backs. Plus, the, uh, the local people who used to um, have brew, uh, local, um, you know, concussions used to sell the turtle eggs because uh, if they just poach one nest, they are going to get a minimum of 70 to 120 eggs. So that's how it was before we started the conservation program. And once the local community members were involved as Sea Turtle Protection Force members, the community understood that they were patrolling the beaches and uh, they should uh, take responsibility. And we made them understand that the turtles, the female turtles come back to the very same beach that they emerged as baby turtles. In India, uh, we have uh, the, ha the, it's the culture that when um, the daughter of the village, the, not the, just the village, the daughters come home to their maternal homes for childbirth. So it's just like that. The turtles are coming back to the same village. So they're daughters of the village. So that's how they took pride to protect the turtles that were coming and nesting along their uh, respective beaches. 
And uh, in Andhra Pradesh, we had a different problem. We had the tribals, the Yenadi tribals, who were patrolling the beaches, not only digging up the eggs, they were also taking the turtles and eating them. And um, so we involved the tribals also to work along with the fishing community members as Sea Turtle Protection Force members. And it is the first time with the Andhra Pradesh Forest Department involved them in this conservation program, wherein they, the earlier poachers of turtles and turtle eggs are now dedicated Sea Turtle Protection Force members because they are given a stipend from the five months of breeding period and they live on uninhabited uh, uh, sandbars during the season and protect the nest and uh, they are given uh, uh, food and water supply every third day it's uh, sent to them by boats and this has given them a kind of a regional pride and a respect and recognition so uh, they now take the program forward and uh, their children are also uh, keenly observing what the community is doing and uh, i think that will take it to the next uh, generation and ensure the future of the conservation program. So thereby the, the poaching has been reduced to a very large extent, I would say. And uh, the enforcement also. Uh, simultaneously, we are uh, networking, getting the enforcement departments to network together. So the enforcement has also become strong and intense awareness on the um, legality of uh, the sea turtles are protected on par with lion, leopard and tiger in India. But not many people are aware of it because sea turtles are not that charismatic as lion, leopard and tiger. So we have uh, conducted intense awareness programs simultaneously. So all these things, multi-pronged approach works to reduce the poaching and the predation. Well, I think you you hit the nail on the head that it does take a, a multi-pronged approach and not only a top-down, but also a bottom-up approach that can also be adapted um, and crafted in these different locations based on the specific need and the specific community interest and investment in conservation. Um, I think I can apply the same concept to my work in Panama, although I'm just starting. So I'm learning some things here tonight that I can apply to the, the illegal wildlife trade issue in Panama with hawksbill shell spurs. Um, there, as you mentioned as well, Supraja, it's not just um, the need for a lower demand and also an increase in um, more intense laws preventing this from happening, but also an increase in the enforcement of the laws. So in Panama, the laws exist protecting sea turtle species and um, eliminating the illegal wildlife trade, but they're just not enforced on a large scale. So that's something that I'm also trying to work to, to join different government agencies together and with the community to, to develop the most comprehensive plan for this specific place in the Pearl Islands archipelago. So thank you for, for all of this advice um, and these stories. So just two more questions. Um, the second to last question, someone wants to know about the egg hatching temperature and why someone would want males versus females if you're incubating eggs in a hatchery and through a breeding program or on the, on the beach. How do you go about monitoring the temperature and making sure that you have the right ratio if you are intervening in the natural course of incubation? So this, I think, could be one that anyone takes because you all have experience with this to some degree. You're on, you're on mute, Supraja. When we relocate the uh, eggs into hatcheries, we have purpose-built hatcheries, not incubators, because sand is the best incubator. And I think the temperature is dependent on the external temperature in the various e uh, regions. In the southern part of uh, India, East Coast, um, the temperature, the pivotal temperature is about 30 degrees. And it takes about uh, 50 to 55 days for the hatchlings to uh, emerge. And um, we uh, naturally, there is a um, 30 to 70% ratio on uh, male and female hatchlings. So there's a good uh, ratio. But uh, when you uh, manage, the, you know, manage the temperature, like during nowadays, it's becoming warmer earlier. 
So we are using coconut uh, leaves to maintain the temperature in the summers so that the temperature is maintained around 30 degrees. But the incubation temperature is always two degrees more inside the sand. So uh, we will it surely will ensure that there'll be um, a 70 percent female and 30 percent male hatchlings. I don't know how it works in incubators. Maybe uh, Caesar could talk about it. But in north, uh, northern, northeast um, India, east coast of India, uh, it's very. It's, the temperatures are much lower, so the incubation period takes longer. So the hatchlings emerge only around the 60th to 65th day. So it takes longer. The temperature is only around uh, 25 to 30 degrees. So I think there'll be more uh, male hatchlings emerging there. Thank you. I have a question uh, related to this, uh, Kali. To our uh, to our freshwater turtle uh, and land uh, tortoise friends, uh, how, does the does the temperature uh, affect the the hatching male or female as much as the sea turtle does? Sure, um, Caesar. May, may I, Caesar? Okay. Um, yes. Uh, yes, it does. And um, there are turtle. Uh, Freshwater turtles, uh, particularly a lot of these softshell turtles that have uh, genos, genotypic sex determination. Um, and there's many uh, other turtles that have the temperature sex uh, determination. But there's also an impact um, of uh, embryonic diapause. So where sea turtles, the eggs are laid and they're, you know, when they're deposited by the female, they're in the late gastrulus stage. And they go, as soon as they're laid, they're triggered and they start developing and they develop rapidly and they go through and they, and they hatch. Well, in, in many freshwater turtles, over, over a third, the eggs are laid and they go in through a period of dormancy. Um, they're still maintaining that late gastro stage and actually to, what, you know, to cease this kind of developmental arrest, the eggs generally have to be chilled. So you have to actually lower the temperature before you can actually uh, break this bio um, um, chemical reaction that hinders the development of the embryo. And then the turtles will go through and start developing. So you can have turtles that lay their eggs and it can spend well over a year incubating, but their incub the, the actual embryogenesis period is quite small. And during that small period of embryogenesis, that's when you can have temperature sex dependence. Wow. I, I, I could talk about that stuff forever. I love that stuff. It's so neat. I could geek out on it. <laughs> Me too. That's so interesting. I know in sea turtle world, we say cool dudes and hot chicks. Yeah. Uh, is it the same for, for freshwater and tortoises? For most, there, there is some reversal, but yeah, usually you want, yeah, cool dudes and hot chicks. Awesome. And for the people that don't understand that males are, are produced at cooler temperatures, female producer at warmer temperatures. And, in, and there's, there's some evidence that uh, female eggs, when they're produced at warmer temperatures, hatch into larger hatchlings. So you want a big, large females and smaller, you know, cooler males. It's some very interesting evolutionary biology. <laughs> well, we're not talking hundreds of degrees of temperature variations. This is just a couple of degrees, I think, correct? Yeah, exactly. you're, you're talking about, you're, you're, there's, there's a medium, you're talking about something, you know, where, you know, you're chilling down to like 10 degrees C and then you're actually, the pivotal incubation temperatures range from anywhere from like 27 to 29 C. So that and pivoting point. How concerned are you about this sex ratio and climate change and increasing temperatures in various habitats all around the world and how that could skew sex ratios on the short and long term? Well, I think it's, it's very interesting. I think in a lot of freshwater environments and a lot of terrestrial environments, we're gonna see, uh, females nesting a lot sooner and how would they nest sooner, do, you know, can that offset these higher summer temperatures? Um, but, you know, they might lose their habitats as, as um, you know, uh, uh, sea levels rise, things become more arid, you know, aquatic environments will change. I mean, some predictions say uh, in 70 years, Maine is going to have a Mediterranean climate. So, you know, how does that all adjust? Um, it's, it's going to be quite interesting to see how the, the animals can adapt and how quickly they can adapt. Um, yeah, I, it's, 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 a, it's a big area of research. 
I know in, in Latin America for leatherback turtles, a lot of the nests are actually just cooking basically, and they're not developing at all if they're left in situ. So a lot of these conservation programs are um, in just like the, the Ocean Learning Center or relocating the, um, the nest to different hatcheries and decreasing the temperature manually to allow for development. Um, and I also studied sea level rise in Equatorial Guinea in West Africa for my master's. And on those five sea turtle nesting beaches that had four different species of turtles, the current estimates were that by 2100, even by 2070, um, there would be only 8% of the current nesting habitat left. Um, and that's only on one of the five beaches. So it is really concerning, not only the skewed sex ratios, the decreased hatching success, but also the loss of nesting habitat, that there are many threats um, intertwined with the climate crisis uh, and, and turtles around the world. So our last question, I don't know if anyone wants to comment further before. <clears throat> no, I, I was just gonna say, um, I absolutely agree um, in, in the, um, in the El Salvador example that I mentioned earlier, uh, out of our five years, we actually had a hatching success rate of about 93% uh, in the nurseries, which is extremely high. Uh, we, we don't, we try not to manipulate um, uh, the, the natural environment, except uh, like Suprajas had said earlier, we, we do put shading uh, as right. well with the palm, uh, palm fronts and things like that. But uh, we, it really, it's really more passive monitoring of the, of the sand temperatures and, and such. But uh, in the case of Nicaragua, maybe Pamela can tell us more because uh, I'm not as familiar with the sand temperatures down there. Yeah, just as an add on there. Yes, so for Nicaragua, what we have done is we've experimented with having some nests in a covered hatchery and leaving some others open. And Callie, what you mentioned earlier about the leather facts, we saw the same thing in the two different types of nests is that we lost, they basically had very poor hatching success where they were left open. And then where the ones were covered, we had greater success. So right now, this is a newer part. In the beginning, we're just in year two in Nicaragua. So in year one, it was established the nesting. At the end of this year, which it's just teetering off right now, we hope to have more temperature data. But at this point, I don't have that to share. We just had our last hatch out of our nest. So more to come on that. But we'll be looking at habitat loss, definitely. We have saw some beach erosion occurring and that is, I think, one of the main things is where are you relocating to? Where, right. and then, yeah, the covering and experimenting perhaps with different techniques, the coconut or covered hatch hatcheries or sacks. Years ago, I saw some sacks where sand was placed in a large, like a 50 pound rice bag and they were moved closer to the land, like inland and the success rates were around 80% was what I recall reading. So don't know, we'll have to see. I mean, there's always a balance. Do you leave sites in situ or are you going to relocate them? With the poaching, absolutely relocation is critical, but now with sea level rise and climate change, there's changes, there's more changes coming. So we're gonna have to have some discussions, some serious discussions about what steps we should take in the future. Well, it's so important that you're able to do that experimentation at this nesting site and look at the different ways that you can um, increase the hatching success because those techniques are going to be extremely valuable worldwide uh, once we can figure out what uh, what's the most efficient. So our last question um, is what can we do to help protect turtles, to help conserve turtles around the world on a large scale, on a small scale, locally, globally? Um, if we could all just go around and share advice that we might have or a particular need that we see on a regular basis before wrapping up. Where do you want to start? Whoever is ready, I can even start. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know in, in sea turtle world, um, plastic pollution is just a major, major problem. And of course, the plastic pollution issue is also uh, focused in company decisions, large scale company decisions about how uh, products are going to be sold. But we as people, we have power in our own decision making capabilities and the things that we buy from day to day. 
So I think one takeaway um, that is not only for sea turtles, but really for, for all turtles and all uh, habitats would be reducing our plastic use um, on a large scale. So change from plastic shampoo bottles and conditioner bottles to shampoo and conditioner bars, uh, get bamboo toothbrushes if you can, um, try to bring a reusable bottle with you everywhere. I bought these bamboo utensils that I keep in my bag so I don't get stranded and need to use plastic forks, knives, or spoons. Um, there's all kinds of little decisions that we can make if we really start to look at it to, to decrease our use of plastic um, and just use our own personal power to, to show um, these different companies what we're willing to purchase and, and what we're willing to, to take. Um, in terms of destruction of the planet. So, and along those lines, I'm not only making personal decisions, but also petitioning like local supermarkets to not use plastic bags or to require uh, reusable bags or charge more for plastic bags. There's all kinds of little things that we can do on larger, but still local scales as well to, to have an impact for the habitats that turtles need to survive. Sufraja. Um, when we go to uh, various schools and companies and talk to them about our sea turtle conservation work, people always ask me this question. We are staying far away from the sea. How can we be involved in sea turtle conservation? But we tell them that you can just look around your own area, your local community, and see what you can do. Because whatever work you do for nature anywhere, because we, are, uh, we have to understand that there is a land-ocean connection. So our actions on land impact the ocean. So whatever little that they can do in their own respective areas, it will help the entire ecosystem. It's not that they have to come to the beach and patrol the beaches and relocate eggs. They can do whatever they can do in their own places like doing uh, pond restoration, cleanups, setting up birdhouses, and uh, also making simple lifestyle changes so that future generations of all life forms can simply live. So this is what we tell everybody and share with them. So I think everyone can look around and see what they can do. And when they take the first step, things will fall into place and then it becomes a large movement. Like um, 20 years back, Jane Goodall helped me to take the first step and this is what we are doing. So I show myself as an example that Every person can do something. You just need to take the first step and understand the land ocean connection. I love that. Those are two great takeaways. Yes, Cesar. Yeah, I think uh, uh, sustainable funding of course, is one of the major challenge for uh, conservation of freshwater turtles and tortoises in Bangladesh. For example, like we have 25 species of turtles and eight of them are critically endangered, which means uh, they're pr probably more threatened than a Bengal tiger. But in country like Bangladesh, most of the focus are, have been on the cash for the species like tigers and elephants. But I, uh, I think, yeah, this is a major challenge. The, the more funding we have, the better work we can do. That's a great point and universal, I think. Thanks for bringing that up. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just to, to talk about Caesar. You know, um, part of my job is, is is to raise money and to raise money for global conservation projects around around the world. And um, you know, conservation is expensive, and it, you know, uh, it it takes a lot. Um, so I encourage people to join a local NGO, uh, find out what they're doing, who they're working with. Um, and become involved and find out, you know, how you can help them raise money. Um, I know that's not always the glamorous thing, but it's one of the key parts of it. But also you can get involved with many of the local groups that are doing things in, in your general area. You know, there's, there's all types of uh, groups that do that. Um, and I think talking to your friends and your family and explaining to your children the importance of turtles uh, and why we want to protect them um, is, is incredibly important. So yeah, I would suggest searching out some local uh, community groups, find out who they are, where they are working and, and get involved. And it, you don't have to be a, an expert at this, you just get involved and volunteer your time. Um, and I think 
people are always happy to have people really who are passionate and, and driven and, and really want to make a difference. Fabian. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded, uh, this conversation reminds me of something very simple my grandfather used to tell me when I was a child, which is people protect what they love. They love what they understand and they understand what they're taught. And per, per uh, everyone's comments here, uh, being able to not only educate, but impassion people to be part of the solution. Let's, rem let's remember that this is a closed loop system. And whether you're on the ocean front or a thousand miles away, water connects everyone on this planet. It connects all life that we know. Uh, it is the conduit for everything that we cherish. And what we do to water, the ocean, rivers, streams, lakes, uh, we do to ourselves. And whether it's plastic pollution, uh, seemingly as simple as a fork or a water bottle that we discard uh, uh, unconsciously or consciously in, a, in an appropriate way, uh, that has very real repercussions. So just by starting simple in our own households and not then choosing not to do these things is already a step in the right direction. Additionally, um, we, we love iconic creatures. You know, these, these sea turtles, whales, dolphins, lions, tigers, uh, all these are uh, canaries in the coal mine. And what's happening to them is happening to our future, whether we know it or not. So it's of paramount importance that we act each and every one of us because the reason we're here today having these discussions is through our acts in the past, little by little, getting us and encroaching on this life support system. So it's uh, very simple uh, to start uh, with things that don't cost you anything. Sometimes it even saves you money. Uh, and uh, to learn that uh, changing our language and our thought process, stop calling it seafood, start calling it sea life, uh, stop thinking that you're throwing something away. There is no such thing as a way. It's a closed loop system, you know, and, and understanding that new approaches, innovative ways, whether it's renewables or um, um, kelp based uh, uh, packaging, uh, things like this are the next step in the evolutionary process. But if we start respecting these animals, I think we're going to go a long way to respecting our future and having a longevity on this planet. Let's not forget the lessons of nature. Uh, evolution, uh, diversification, and adaptation are key for our species to live and thrive on this planet in symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. with these beautiful sea turtles and land turtles and tortoises and all the other sentient beings that we share this space with. Wow. I don't think there's a better way to close the evening. So thank you. Uh, this has been quite a special event and I want to thank our incredible guests personally on behalf of the Explorers Club and on behalf of the audience for their time tonight, especially given some of the very early hours in Eastern time zones and the, the lengthy nature of our, of our program tonight. Um, and of course, thank you for all of your incredibly impactful work. You're an inspiration to us all to make make a difference for nature and protect what we love. Thank you also to Luis, Kevin, and Anne who helped to put this event together. Um, just a few reminders, this Wednesday is the Explorers Club 50 Ocean Stewards, followed by our Chapter Connect program from Spain on Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Make sure to tune in. Also keep an eye out for the Explorers Club week-long World Oceans Week programming, which starts on June 6th at 7 p.m. We will be bringing you life and livelihoods of the ocean. Thank you again to our audience for celebrating World Turtle Day with us and sticking with us till the end. We hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you next time.